Awesome. Well, thank you uh, for having me here today. Um, I know most of the residents in the room because you guys have probably rotated at David Grant before. I know some of the attendings, but uh, I'm Logan Rollins. I'm one of the uh, uh, general surgeons at David Grant Medical Center. I'm also, my specialty is bariatric surgery, so I probably do about 50-50 weight loss surgery and 50% general surgery as, as what my practice is. Today, we're going to talk about bariatric surgical emergencies. And I think this is a really important topic, especially for the residents and for any general surgeons that are going to be working in an emergency room. And really the whole, the whole focus of the talk today is, is really on those two audiences, is people that are taking emergency general surgery call and, and, and general surgery residents that may be in a hospital where they're maybe the only surgeon, there's no bariatric surgeon, there's no GI, you know, like you may not have all the things that you have at a, a major large academic university like UC Davis. Um, so just realize that when you leave here, when you graduate, you may be at a smaller place that doesn't have all those resources and you may be the bariatric surgeon or the person taking care of the bariatric emergencies at that hospital, especially if something comes in emergently. The thing that's really important to realize is that these are really just GI tract operations. I think a lot of people get scared of these patients and they, and they think that they're lepers and they're like, oh, once a bariatric surgeon's touched them, like I can never touch them again because they belong to the bariatric surgeon. But really, this is not brain surgery, okay? This is just GI tract surgery. And if you do colon operations and you do x laps for small bowel obstruction, you, and you do general surgery, you're doing essentially what the skills that you need in order to take care of emergency bariatric surgery patients, okay? It's also important to note that the American Board of Surgery has started incorporating a lot of bariatric surgery questions in the ab site, the certifying exam, and the qualifying exam. So these questions are showing up, uh, especially on the oral boards and the, and the written boards. So you need to know about them. And the American Board of Surgery expects that you're going to know how to take care of some of these emergencies and the things related to bariatric surgery. And the, right now, there's about 200,000 bariatric operations being done every year in the U.S. So as you can imagine, as the years pile on, there's going to be millions of these patients that are going to be out in the U.S. that are going to show up at some emergency room at some point in time with potentially a complication that you're going to have to deal with. Okay, so the way I have this talk arranged today is really kind of an oral board style format of, well, you know, if you were a general surgery resident taking your oral boards and you're going to get a, a question on bariatric surgery, what are the qu common questions that you're probably going to be faced with and, and what are the, what's the workup in the scenario that you're going to want to go through? So I have six individual cases we're going to go through and we're going to go through them individually. So the first case is uh, the, uh, that of a 40-year-old female who presents five years out from, from having a lap band placed. She's been having persistent nausea, vomiting, and it says four days here, but let's say that it's been going on for longer than that, but really it's just been horrible in the last four days. And she's really at the point in time right now where she can't even swallow her own spit, okay? She has had no bariatric follow-up for three years. She's tachycardic, borderline hypotensive, white counts normal, hemoglobin is normal, K's low. She's got a little bit of AKI, and her albumin is 3.7. So she's really not nutritionally deplete. A lot of times people think that all bariatric patients, you know, have an albumin of one, and that's just really not true. So, um, so we're not really concerned about her, her overall nutrition. So then they ask you, okay, doctor, what do you want to do next for this patient? So the thing that should go through your mind is if you have somebody that comes in and they've got an obstruction around their stomach, a AKA the lap band, um, and they can't swallow spit, there's only one thing that should cross your mind, which is I have to relieve that obstruction, okay? So how are you gonna do that? The first thing you should think of is I need to deflate the band, okay? Patient may not know how much fluid is in the band. It may be super full, it may be empty, you don't know, but you need to stick a needle into the port and take all of the fluid out. And this is not a time where you're like, oh, I'll take out a CC or two and see if you feel better. I would just take all the fluid out and don't even worry about the fact that the band is empty. If the patient, if they want it refilled in the future, they can always get it refilled back again. You're dealing with the emergency that's going on, okay? This is a picture that really shows kind of what a band looks like um, from, from, from the inside. So you can see this is where it's empty and this is where it's full. And as you can imagine, when stomach's in the middle, um, it's gonna be significantly narrowed um, as you add more fluid to the band. The band actually also has tubing that goes to a port that looks very similar to a chemotherapy port. It's, it's exactly the same thing. Um, and all you have to do is stick a needle into that port to draw the fluid out. So the next question is, the examiner is going to say, well, what type of needle do you want to use, doctor? And you're like, well, I don't know, a needle that's, that pokes like through the, the, the port, right? But the, really, the, re the answer is you want to use a Huber needle. And that's something that a lot of people don't, don't realize is that anytime you access a chemotherapy port or a lap band port, you want to use a non-coring needle. Because if the patient actually wants to keep their band and you start putting a coring needle through that, um, through that port, you're going to potentially destroy it and it's going to leak and it's going to have to come out and get changed. So anytime you access these, you want to use a Huber needle. Um, typically, the ones we use in bariatric surgery patients are long, specialized Huber needles, which you may or may not have access to. 
Um, uh, but ideally, that's what you kind of want to use. It also depends on how thick their abdominal wall is and where the port is located because ports are not always put in the same location. Bar different bariatric surgeons put them all throughout the abdominal wall. So you just need to kind of feel for it, look for it, ask the patient, and it's usually over their biggest incision um, that's on their abdominal wall, okay? So you, re you remove all the fluid, then the examiner says, well, what do you want to do next? Well, you have a patient that you relieve their obstruction, but you know they've been vomiting for X amount of days, and you know that they have, their K is low, and they, they have AKI. So just fall back on general surgery principles. Where you are, we already heard this this morning. You want to resuscitate the patient. So give them fluid, replace their electrolytes, and then the, and then the examiner says, well, doctor, is there any other medication that you might want to give to this patient? And you sit there, you're like, hmm, I'm not sure. And they're like, well, what if this patient was confused and had some double vision? Is there any other problem that you're worried about? And one of the other things you always should be worried about is potentially Wernicke's encephalopathy in patients that have persistent vomiting. And so these patients need to have IV thiamine replacement and it should be given in the emergency department, either in the form of a banana bag with the folate and the multivitamin or just giving straight up the thiamine. Um, it's also important to know that you should not give a bunch of glucose before you give the thiamine because thiamine is a very important cofactor in the TCA cycle. Um, and if you give too much glucose before giving the thiamine to somebody who's thiamine uh, deficient, you can actually put them into lactic acidosis. So just make sure that you give the thiamine before you give the glucose. So if anybody comes in persistently vomiting, that's a bariatric patient, I always just have them get a banana bag in the emergency room. It's kind of like their first, first step, okay? So you've resuscitated the patient. Now what are you gonna do? Okay, so you have this patient that has a lap band that presents with an obstruction and vomiting. You've removed the fluid, but what's the complication that's gonna lead to persistent vomiting in a lap band patient? And the first thing that should cross your mind is the patient has a band slip, okay? Um, what are you gonna do for this? You really wanna start with a plain film of the belly. You wanna look and see where, what's the position of the band? Where is the band located? Is there anything abnormal about the way that the band looks? Okay, and then the examiner says, okay, well, doctor, that's great. You order the x-ray, but what's a normal band position? Okay, so this is what a normal band looks like. So the band should always be kind of on in, and it should always be pointing towards the left shoulder, okay? And there's this thing called a phi angle or a phi angle, which however you want to pronounce it, and it should be about 45 degrees um, pointing towards the left shoulder. There's a range there, but in general, about 45 degrees is a normal position, okay? And when I say band slip, that's kind of a misnomer. Some people think that the band actually slips, when in reality, it's actually the stomach that slips underneath the band and ends up above it. Typically, you're only supposed to have about the size of an egg above the band, and if you get too much stomach above that, um, that's abnormal. And as the band gets pushed down by that excess stomach, um, it, there's more stomach in between the band, which is what leads to the obstruction, okay? So this is a picture of what an abnormal band position would look like. This is a, a flat band with a, with, a, with a phi angle of about 90 degrees. Um, this is one that's called an O sign, where, which is where you see the band kind of flipped over completely, and that's, that's very abnormal. And then there's another one here uh, showing an upper GI of the band, and the band is actually pointed in the opposite direction towards the right shoulder, and that's also abnormal. And you can see that they gave the patient contrast here, and there's this huge amount of stomach above the band. And remember I said it's the size of an egg, so this is way too much stomach that's up there, okay? And this is what it will look like if you scope the patient and put a scope in, is you have this huge amount of excess stomach above the level of the band, and, and the stomach can actually become, in turn, ischemic, okay? So the examiner says, okay, doctor, you do your, your x-ray, you do your upper GI, and it shows that there's a small to moderate slip, but the patient cannot, still cannot tolerate fluids after you remove the band. What do you want to do next, okay? So there's a very simple algorithm here. If you have a small slip on upper GI um, after, and, and the patient's tolerating liquids, that is an elective band removal. That does not have to be taken out emergently. Patient can, can be referred to a bariatric surgeon and can have that, that done some other time. But if it's a very large slip, or the patient is not tolerating liquids, then you have to do an emergency band removal. So the band needs to come out right then and there, okay? This is not rocket science again. So um, when you remove the band, you're just basically just taking this thing out of the abdominal cavity. These should all and can all be done laparoscopic. It's not a very difficult operation. So you put in a couple of ports. You can see here, I'm actually using a liver retractor, um, a camera and three, three ports, two operation and one assistant. When I do this now, I usually just do three ports, just one camera and, and, and two, uh, two, two um, uh, instrument ports for the uh, operating surgeon. Um, you get in there, you kind of just lift the liver up with your left hand and you can identify the band. This is kind of an older style band that we don't really use anymore. 
And there's always a bunch of kind of like adhesions uh, around the, um, the band uh, capsule and the buckle that you kind of have to take down. You can see I'm using an ultrasonic de uh, device here, but typically when I do this now, I just use monopolar cautery, just kind of lice some of those until you can get the buckle where you can unbuckle it. And really it's just like any other buckle, you just ratchet it in different directions and it, un it pops open. If you can't uh, unratchet it, you can always cut the band. It's coming out anyway, so who cares if it goes in the trash can in two pieces? So you can cut it if, if you can't get it unratcheted. Um, and then once you have it unbuckled, you have to kind of pull it out. And a lot of times these things can get very stuck behind the stomach. So it actually takes a lot more force than you think. You really got to kind of yank on it. And if you feel like you're pulling too much, it's probably the right amount. Okay. So you got to yank it out. You got to cut it from the abdominal wall and pull it out. And I usually pull it out through one of the, the, the 12 port sites that, that I put in um, and just kind of pull it with the trocar and the, it, the whole thing just kind of slides out. Okay. Also, don't forget to cut down and remove the, the, the port, the, the uh, adjustment port as well. Um, just cut down on the abdominal wall and take that out. And that's really not hard. That's just kind of sutured in with a couple of sutures, just like any type of chemotherapy port. Okay. So the band is removed. The stomach still appears ischemic and does not pink up. Okay, doctor, what do you want to do now? And you're like, crap. The stomach's ischemic, so what am I going to do? Well, it depends on like really how ischemic. If it kind of just looks a little purple, you can say, well, maybe I'll just do a temporary abdominal closure and come back and look at it in 24 hours. But if it looks ischemic, then it's probably going to have to come out. You know, if, if it's been stuck for a long period of time and it's not going to recover, especially when you take the band off, it should pink up pretty quickly. You may be, have to be prepared to do a gastrectomy and a damage control operation. Okay. If you get to this point in time in the question, you're doing pretty well. Okay. So let's go back a little bit and let's say that the, the same lap band patient presented, but instead of having vomiting, they present with a port site infection, okay? Uh, what is really the first thing that sh should go through your mind when a lap band patient presents with a port site infection? And that should be that that's a band erosion until proven otherwise. So how are you gonna diagnose this? You need to do an EGD, okay? So you need to stick a scope in there and take a look. And, and when you look inside there in your retroflex, you should see the band actually inside the stomach, which is not normal. I did see a GI doctor one time, um, you know, uh, send a report to one of the surgeons I was working with uh, when I was a resident that said, you know, did an EGD, looked, at the, looked inside the stomach, saw the band, it looked great, um, refer back to the bariatric surgeon. <laughs> so that's, uh, this is obviously not normal. This should not be in the stomach. And so if the band is eroded, it has to come out. Um, but you need to be able to have the skills to perform a simple EGD and stick a scope down and take a look and see, because again, you may not have GI where you are. Okay. So we're going to move on to case number two. Okay. This is going to be the case of a, of a patient who's three years out from a ruin my gastric bypass. I'm going to take a little bit um, of a sidestep for a second before we go into the case. Every attending has their own like little pet peeve. You know, you guys all know that every attending has got this weird thing that that they just can't stand. And this is mine, which is um, a lot of times I hear you, the residents say, this is a ruin Y. And I tell people a ruin Y is not an operation. A ruin Y is a type of reconstruction. So you can reconstruct, reconstruct an esophagus, a stomach, a bile duct, a pancreas, all in a ruin Y fashion. Um, these operations are called gastric bypass or sleeve gastrectomy. So it's not a ruin Y. It can be a ruin Y gastric bypass, but there's also multiple ways to reconstruct a gastric bypass and a ruin Y is not the only way. So I would say in your, in your learning, try to um, avoid using the term ruin Y by itself and actually use the word gastric bypass or call it a ruin Y gastric bypass. Okay. So we'll get back off that tangent again. Um, so this patient's three years out from their gastric bypass. They had very good weight loss, about 80% excess weight loss at, uh, at three years. Um, but they present to you with acute onset nausea, vomiting, abdominal distension, and back pain for 24 hours. Okay. They're a little bit tachycardic, not borderline hypotensive. Their white counts a little bit up borderline hemoglobin's normal, but AST, ALT, lipase and lactate are all elevated. Okay. So anytime you have a gastric bypass patient that presents to you with nausea and vomiting, they kind of just came out of the middle of nowhere. Just all of a sudden, there's only really one thing that should be going through your mind that you absolutely have to rule out. And that's an internal hernia bowel obstruction. Okay. This is a surgical emergency and needs to be operated on as soon as possible. So how are you going to diagnose this? You, you absolutely need to get a CT scan. Any gastric bypass patient that presents to the ER with abdominal pain needs to get a CT scan. They should never leave the ER without a CAT scan. Okay. You should have a very low threshold for doing diagnostic laparoscopy on these patients just to look in their belly to see whether or not they have that, even if the CT scan is equivocal. Okay. There's essentially no role for concern conservative management in this disease because if somebody really does have an internal hernia bowel obstruction and you wait too long and the bowel gets obstructed in this internal hernia and dies, that can lead to extensive small bowel necrosis and death. And then you maybe have a patient with short gut. Uh, and so that, that's a major problem. And, and I've seen that before. 
So one of the questions that the examiner may then ask you is, well, what are the potential mesenteric defects with a gastric bypass? And so that is something that you definitely need to know. And it kind of depends on how the gastric bypass is done. So it can be done in two different ways. Um, anticholic is probably the most common way that it's done, which is um, where the, the rulum is actually brought on top of the colon. And in that situation, there's only two mesenteric defects. There's the defect where the, where the JJ is, where you reconstruct the bowel, and we, clo we always close that during surgery. And then there's what's called the Peterson's hernia defect, which is posterior to the rule limb. So when you divide the bowel, you've created an opening there. And when you flo flop that rule limb up there, there's going to be a defect uh, behind that. Not everybody that, who does an anticholic gastric bypass closes the Peterson's defect because it usually ends up being a very large defect. So that's always something to be concerned about. Some people close it, some people don't. I think that um, the way that I do it, and I think Dr. Ali does it this way as well, is we both, I think, do retrocolic. Um, and so that actually creates a third mesenteric defect where it actually, the rule limb goes through the transverse colon mesentery. The reason why I do that is because it's the most direct route for the rule limb to get up to the pouch. It doesn't go over top of the stomach and the colon. And so that's my preferred route, just because it's a shorter pathway to get back there, okay? But when you do that, that creates a third mesenteric defect called a transverse mesocolic defect, which also needs to be closed and is another potential space for where you could get in internal hernia bowel obstruction, okay? So the examiner says, okay, well, what are maybe two CAT scan findings that would, that would show you that, or indicate to you that there might be an internal hernia bowel obstruction? And the first thing that you should think about it is, is that these patients do not present like normal um, uh, patients who have bowel obstructions. And when a, any gastric bypass patient should never have fluid into the, in, in their gastric remnant or, or their stomach that is not you know, seeing food anymore. If you see any f significant amount of fluid in the gastric remnant, that patient needs to be in the operating room because that is a, that is a bowel obstruction, uh, internal hernia bowel obstruction to proven otherwise. So gastric remnant distension is one big thing. And then the, the, you could potentially see a swirl sign twisting in the mesentery from the small bowel being stuck into the internal hernia defect. Now, you may not always see the swirl sign. So even if the swirl sign's not there, um, you, you still should probably take the patient back to the OR um, and, and look. So what about um, when you do the operation? What are some pearls for doing it? Um, when you get in there, you know, you can do most of these operations laparoscopically. Um, most of the bowel is not dilated, so, so it's not like the whole bowel is dilated and you're not going to be able to get a port in. You can usually get a port in and start taking a look, but usually it's hard to kind of see where the anatomy goes. There's things that are really twisted, especially if there is an internal hernia bowel obstruction. So typically what I do is I always start at the cecum, okay, and then run backwards. And that bowel is usually decompressed and very easy to handle. And then as you start to run the bowel backwards, you, a lot of times you'll actually reduce the internal hernia, okay? So you find an internal hernia, you reduce it, and you have this hole. How are you going to repair the defect? You always want to make sure that you use non-absorbable suture. And this is a mistake I see some people make sometimes is that they want to use like Vicryl or PDS to close this. And, and that's going to absorb and then your hole is going to come back again. So you want to use something that's non-absorbable. I typically use Ethabond. Um, that's my preferred uh, type of suture to use this. You can do it in an interrupted or a running fashion. But I think the big thing is, is always need to tie knots. Some people get all excited about using lapper ties and barb suture and all that stuff. But really, I think a lot of that stuff comes undone and you really need to tie knots on either end when, when, you're, when you're fixing these. So just like when you guys do FLS, you guys need to know how to tie a knot laparoscopically, okay? Some other pearls about these cases, like I said, they, they can and usually should be done laparoscopic. But with that said, I've converted on some of these patients where you know I just can't figure out the anatomy and there's so much small bowel dilation, but that's usually the exception rather than the norm. Um, you got to rule out other causes of obstruction, such as adhesive, and then always be careful with NG tubes on these patients. Um, it's rarely necessary that you ever need to place an NG tube in these patients. It's not like a normal bowel obstruction. And you also have to realize that the small bowel is connected to this very small gastric pouch that's very proximal. And if it's dilated from vomiting and, 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 from, and from fluid backing up, it's going to be um, uh, very easy to perforate with an NG tube. So um, if any NG tubes are ever placed, they really need to be done under fluoro, under direct guidance. And you, uh, you don't need to place these blindly because you can put a hole into the small bowel by doing that. Okay. Then the examiner may say, well, doctor, are there other causes of gastric bypass obstruction besides internal hernia? And at this point in time, they're just asking you kind of about your knowledge about gastric bypass obstruction. So there's a lot of other places where people could develop obstructions. You could develop a, a narrowing at the gastrojejunal anastomosis, and that's usually related to how the anastomosis was done. Typically, if you use a 21 EEA circular stapler, that is a much higher rate of, of stricture or, uh, at that anastomosis. 
You could also have a, uh, a narrowing in the transverse mesocolic um, defect that you created. So if you close that space too tight, I've actually seen a patient obstruct from that in the past. You always need to be worried about the JJ anastomosis. They could have a stricture there. They could have a bezoar there. I had one guy that ate a whole bunch of nuts one time but didn't chew them very well, presented with a bowel obstruction, did a CAT scan, and like all these nuts were just kind of stuck at the JJ. And we just kind of gave him some gastrographin and watched him and it cleared out. But that can happen, okay? Um, you can develop a hematoma at the JJ, but that's usually an early thing after gastro bypass, not, not a late finding. Um, you can develop an intussusception. So the, the JJ is a known reason for why the distal small bowel could actually intussuscept into the JJ and cause a bowel obstruction. And you always need to be, be thinking about and worried about what's called a ruin O, which is not a really common complication of gastro bypass. It's basically where the surgeon hooked the bowel up together wrong. So instead of um, hooking the rule limb up to the gastro pouch, they hooked the biliopancreatic limb, and then they hooked the rule limb up downstream. These patients are not completely obstructed because they have a drainage route um, uh, for their bowel, but they do present with similar symptoms to obstruction with nausea and vomiting and bile reflux and abdominal pain. Um, so you always need to be thinking about that in the back of your mind is, you know, was the bowel hooked up incorrectly by the surgeon? And I certainly have heard and seen of those cases before, okay? The next case we're going to look at is another gastro bypass patient who now presents with epigastric pain that's worse with eating, but may not necessarily be relate, related to vomiting. This patient has severe acute worsening in the last 24 hours, is mildly tachycardic, not really hypotensive, white counts up a little bit, but hemoglobin is normal. So what's your main concern? So besides internal hernia obstruction, the other major long-term complication of gastro bypass you always need to have in your mind is gonna be marginal ulcer, okay? And that's where you're gonna get an ulcer at the connection of the, the, uh, the pouch to the small bowel. So then the examiner asks you, well, what two questions do you wanna ask the patient about things that they've been doing at home or something in their history um, while you're taking their history? And the big thing is you always wanna ask about nicotine and NSAIDs. And that's just one thing that like, when I talk to ER docs on the phone, they like never ask these patients. And, and I just, it just shocks me that, that this is not part of what they know and they're working with the patients. But primary care doctors don't know it either. A lot of primary care doctors say, oh, you had a gastro bypass, but now you've got joint pain and you need to be on NSAIDs. And they throw them on 800 ibuprofen you know, six times a day, and they present with ulcer, and then they wonder why. Um, so it's really important on us to help educate the primary care doctors and say, okay, these patients cannot have NSAIDs because they're a prime culprit for causing ulcers, and they can't smoke. Because if you smoke, that's a, a big reason why you could develop an ulcer there, okay? So what's the next step? Okay, you have a patient that has a suspected marginal ulcer. They have severe uh, worsening uh, with tachycardia and leukocytosis. Not only are you worried that they have an ulcer, but you're worried that the ulcer has perforated, okay? So you always want to obtain a CT scan to rule out uh, marginal ulcer perforation, okay? So let's say you do the CAT scan and it shows that there's no perforation. What's the next step? Well, you want to prove that they have a marginal ulcer. So you should do an EGD to confirm the diagnosis, okay? Well, let's say that there's a micro perforation. There's a couple of small bubbles of air by the anastomosis, but no free perforation that's seen, no leakage of contrast. Um, what are you gonna do at that point in time? Well, your concern is, is that you don't wanna make that worse. So I would typically delay an EGD in this patient, not do it um, uh, acutely. I would just admit them, observe them, put them on antibiotics, but then I would follow the CAT scan up with an upper GI just to really confirm that they don't have a leak because sometimes the CAT scan can miss leaks um, uh, with the limited amount of contrast that these patients get. So you really should follow that up with a dynamic study such as an upper GI to truly rule out that they don't have a leak, okay? And then what if they have free peritonitis uh, or free perforation in peritonitis? Um, those patients are usually gonna present a lot sicker and they're gonna need an emergent operation. And when you take them back, you're gonna essentially treat that patient just like you would treat a duodenal ulcer. You're gonna just do a gram patch on that. Avoid the temptation to close the hole because anytime you try to close this hole, you're just gonna make it worse. So you just wanna temporize the patient, get them better, and then if they still have problems long-term, they can be operated on by a bariatric surgeon or a general surgeon that feels comfortable with resecting that and redoing it or doing some other operation. But emergently, if the patient has free perforation, you're just going to treat them with a gram patch. So the examiner may say, okay, well, doctor, besides NSAIDs and nicotine, what are maybe some other reasons why people might develop marginal ulcers? Um, so foreign body can sometimes be a, a, a nidus. So sutures, especially non-absorbable sutures, um, can be a nidus, usually not staples. Staples are an, are an inert material, especially the ones that we use on the GI tract. So you may see staples when you scope a patient, but that's usually not a reason for why they develop a marginal ulcer. You can develop a fistula between the remnant stomach and the, uh, the, uh, the gastrojuvenal anastomosis called a GG fistula, and that's a reason why they could develop an ulcer as well. 
Early on after surgery, if you have too much tension on the anastomosis, that can lead to ischemia of the anastomosis, and that can develop an early marginal ulcer. And then anything that increases acid, you know, especially stress ulcers in patients or any other um, in, uh, disorders that increase acid exposure can also lead to uh, marginal ulcers. H. pylori is very controversial. There are certainly a lot of surgeons that believe that it does cause marginal ulcers. I'm not one of those people. Uh, I think that there's some good data that shows that it doesn't. So I don't really check for H. pylori in these patients. I don't really treat them for it. I don't think it really matters. Uh, I, don't, I do not think that it's a causative factor for marginal ulcers. Certainly a causative factor for duodenal and for some gastric, but, but usually not marginal ulcers, but that's debatable, okay? And always realize that when you see an ulcer, it's gonna be at the gastrojuvenal margin or just distal to that on the small bowel. And that's gonna be the location of where you're gonna find these, okay? They may ask you, what are the cornerstones for initial management of a marginal ulcer? Um, and really, it's just treating any ulcer. You wanna provide um, maximal acid suppression with PPIs, obviously eliminate any inciting causes, such as the ones we've previously listed, and then ma maintaining good nutrition, okay? If you have a patient that's been smoking or using NSAIDs and they don't stop that, they're not gonna heal. If you have a patient that doesn't eat and doesn't get new good nutrition, they're not gonna heal. So you have to make sure you do those things to heal that marginal ulcer. And most of these, 90, 95% of these, will heal on their own without any intervention, okay? Any surgical intervention. Now, what if you know the patient has a marginal ulcer and then all of a sudden they begin to feel tired and pale and weak? What are you worried about at that point in time? Okay, well, you're worried that maybe that ulcer is bleeding. Okay, so you wanna check a hemoglobin on that patient. Let's say the hemoglobin falls down from 14 down to seven. Okay, you're concerned that the patient has a bleeding ulcer. So at this point in time, you definitely need to stick a scope down and take a look and see if you have a bleeding ulcer. Um, and if you do, then you know, potentially be prepared to do things like epi injection, argon, plasma, coagulation, or potentially put a clip on it. And this is a patient that I had recently that had a bleeding marginal ulcer, and I just put a clip on it and it stopped and transfused her and, and she did well, okay? So moving on to the next case. So this is a sleeve gastrectomy patient that's about seven days out from surgery, okay? They come into the ER and they're complaining of fevers, chest and back pain, and difficulty breathing, okay? They're tachycardic, hypotensive, febrile, and have an elevated white count, okay? That, that is like the classic picture for I have a leak, like screaming, I have a leak. But you should always keep in the back of your mind that any of these bariatric patients are presenting with difficulty breathing and chest and back pain can certainly also have a pulmonary embolus, okay? So you always want, whenever you're trying to rule out leak, you always wanna rule out pulmonary embolus and vice versa because a lot of times they present very similarly. So this is what your suspicion is. What are you gonna do next? Well, these patients obviously need a CAT scan. You wanna make sure you scan their chest and scan their belly to look, okay? And this is the CAT scan you get. Let's say that the, the chest CT is negative for, for PE, but this is the abdominal CT scan. And what you're seeing here is, is that this is the sleeve, this kind of black here is the lumen of the bowel, this is the staple line, and then you have this big abscess here that is just next to the staple line, and probably the hole is right here, okay? So this is very classic for a leak after a gastro bypass. So what are, you, what are you gonna do with this? Well, you could follow this up with an upper GI, but chances are, with this big, huge abscess there, you just wanna get, get, get that drained first. If there's not a large abscess there, but you're still suspicious of a, of a leak, then I would do an upper GI next, okay? Your abscess is confirmed by this CAT scan, so what are you gonna do next? I would place an IR drain. Would I take this patient back to the operating room? Probably not. And the reason why is because it's seven days out. If you discover a leak on post day number one, I would probably take them back to the operating room because there's not a lot of adhesions that have formed. But seven days out from surgery, there's gonna be such a huge inflammatory response in the belly that getting in there, you're probably gonna make things worse. And usually you have a walled off abscess by seven days that you can just do IR percutaneous drain uh, of this abscess. And that's what we did in this case. And then we followed that up with an upper GI and you can see that the staple line is kind of like right here and that this is contrast outside of the stomach and that it is being drained um, by the drain, okay? So do you need to explore these patients? No, um, I have seen disasters where surgeons at outside facilities that don't know what they're doing are taking care of these people and they open them up, um, you know, do a big, huge laparotomy. They go in there, they, they, just, they mess up this whole contained abscess. They try to close the hole, they make it worse. And those patients are gonna do much, much worse than if you just do a perk drain on them, okay? So the IR drains in, the leak's confirmed. What are you gonna do next? You're going to treat this person for their leak, okay? The cornerstones of treating a leak from any type of upper anastomosis, uh, upper uh, GI anastomosis, is make the patient NPO, provide them with some type of good nutrition, and give them antibiotics for some period of time, okay? Now, nutrition for a sleep patient is probably going to be in the form of a J-tube or TPN. You don't really have access to the stomach anymore because you've taken most of it out. 
Um, so you can't put a G tube in, but you can either put a J tube in for enteral feeds or do TPN. Some patients also, you could potentially put in a nasojejunal feeding tube, but those patients are probably going to hate you because they're going to have that in for six months. Uh, and so typically I would uh, put like a J tube in most of these people. Okay. Also, you need to verify that there's no distal obstruction because if there's a distal obstruction in the stomach, that leak is probably never going to heal. Okay. So what's the most common location for a sleeve leak? And it's really at the angle of hiss. So the angle of hiss is this junction of the uh, esophagus to, to the fundus of the stomach, kind of this point right here. And that's the point where, the, where the, uh, the, the tissue of the stomach is the thinnest and the weakest and the blood supply is the most tenuous. Um, if you put that staple line too close to the esophagus, that's a setup for developing a leak there. Um, if you use too big or too a small of a staple load, that's potentially a setup for, for a leak of the angle of hiss. And then what's even more important is what you do at the incisura. So if you put make the staple line too close here down at the incisura and you create an obstruction there, that's going to be a point of, of obstruction where it's going to cause blowout um, further up at, at the angle of hiss. And so you have to verify that you don't didn't create an, an, an obstruction there by making it too narrow or too tight. Okay. And we talked about why that is. Okay. What are some alternative therapies for sleeve leak? If you get to this point in time in the question, again, you're probably doing you know pretty well. Um, and they may or may not even ask you that. But just for your, your educational knowledge, uh, besides just doing NPO and nutritional support, some people have tried doing endoluminal stents for these sleeves where they actually stent the incisura, the leak, and the GE junction to help uh, uh, prevent any like um, gastric or contents or, uh, or anything from leaking into the abscess cavity. And that has been shown when done early to potentially decrease the time of healing. But those patients will absolutely hate you because this is extremely painful. They all get bile reflux and they just beg you for the stent out. Okay. You can use large clips on the inside of the bowel. Um, I, I think a, the brand name is like a Vesco clip, but it's like a bear claw clip. I really hate doing that. I think it's a really bad idea because it really creates a foreign body there that's going to lead to prolonged fistula. And I've, I've seen patients that have fistulas that never heal because someone tried to put a clip there. So I typically tend to not do that. There's a newer technique some people are doing called a septotomy, which essentially is basically just making the leak bigger. So um, if there's a small hole that's leaking into a big abscess cavity, uh, part of the reason why that never closes is because it doesn't have a, a way to drain back into the stomach. So if you just kind of do a, a septum release of, of that abscess cavity, you basically create a wide open space and it typically will, will heal faster. That's kind of definitely an advanced GI endoscopy thing that uh, even some GI doctors wouldn't feel comfortable doing. Um, you could do a T-tube to this, like you could uh, put a, a Foley in there or put a T-tube in and make a controlled fistula to the skin. Or you could actually just bring up a loop of, of, of bowel and do a Roux and Y fistula jejunostomy. And that essentially will allow the leak to, to go down to normal bowel and the patient will get better faster and you can just start feeding them right away. Okay. How do gastric bypass leaks differ compared to sleeve leaks. Um, and the, the, the biggest thing is, is that usually with gastro bypass leaks, they usually occur at the gastrojejunal anastomosis. Um, and that's the most common place that they occur. They typically heal a lot faster than sleeve leaks, um, which is great for you because the patients are not in your um, office every week for nine months. Um, and then you, you still have access to the stomach to place a G-tube. So in, the, in gastro bypass patients that have a leak, I always put a G-tube in those people because that's the way that you can feed them. You do not need to do a J-tube, but always put a G-tube in, in, in those people. Okay. And then the same principles apply. Drain the, air, the abscess, provide antibiotics, provide nutrition, verify no distal obstruction. Okay. Uh, case number five, so another sleeve patient um, that is only one day out from surgery, okay, presents now with nausea, abdominal discomfort, and, and severe abdominal wall bruising. They're tachycardic, hypotensive, and you've noticed that their hemoglobin level um, dropped from 14 to 8, okay? And the big question is, what is your concern? And everyone should be thinking, okay, well, this person probably has a bleed because of their huge drop in hemoglobin, okay? So acute bleeding is your concern. What's a normal drop of hemoglobin after any type of a bariatric operation? I tell people it's less than two grams. If you have somewhere in that range, it's probably okay. But if it's more than that, you should be concerned about oozing or bleeding in these patients. What's your transfusion trigger? Really no different than any other surgical patient that you're taking care of. Um, you know, Typically, I transfuse people if their hemoglobin is less than seven and they're symptomatic, or if they have a heart history, if they're less than 10. Okay, So you transfuse this person. Um, what are you going to do next? You're going to obtain a CAT scan. You want to figure out really whether or not they actually have a hematoma and where that hematoma might be. Okay, so here's a CAT scan of what you might see. And here you can see that there's a, a large amount of blood here. This is actually not a horrible CAT scan, 
But the concerning about part about this CAT scan is that the, the blood is, is near the staple line. And it, it kind of depends on where the blood is. If there's a lot of blood near the staple line, that's very concerning. And the reason for that is because if the blood gets infected and blood is a great culture medium and you have this infected hematoma sitting by your staple line, that's a huge setup for developing a leak after a sleeve gastrectomy. So if the hematoma is large and sitting by the staple line, I will typically take them back to, to, uh, to uh, uh, suck all that hematoma out. But if the hematoma is somewhere else that's not really on the staple line, I typically will watch it. And I actually just had one of these last week and the, the hematoma was right around the spleen, um, but it wasn't near the staple line, so we just watched it. But have a very low threshold for considering taking these people back and sucking out the hematoma, especially if it's near the staple line, okay? Will you find the bleeding vessel when you go back? Probably not, okay? These things are usually small, they're usually in my opinion, they come from the greater curve vessels that you take down with your uh, energy device. Some people think that they come from the staple line, and some of them probably do. But really, in reality, most of these come from the, the greater curve vessels that you divide. It's usually not from the staple line. Okay. This is the last case. So you got a, a gastric bypass patient that's a one year out from surgery. Um, they present to you with right upper quadrant pain for two days. That's worsening. They have no vomiting, but they have abdominal distension. So no vomiting, abdominal distension, or epigastric pain. Their white count's up a little bit, borderline, afebrile, and then all of their LFTs are elevated. What are you worried about in this patient? Well, your first question should be to them is, do you still have a gallbladder? Um, and if they do have a gallbladder, that's probably gonna be the prime culprit given the, the LFTs that you're worried about here, okay? So you're worried that they have some gallstones that have formed, which is fairly common in gastro bypass patients that lose a lot of weight as they can develop gallstones. And then if they become symptomatic, that's obviously a concern. So what tests are you gonna do? Fall back on general surgery principles. You're gonna treat them just like any other patient. You're gonna do your right upper quadrant ultrasound. If you're concerned, you might even get an MRCP to see if there's stones in the duct. And let's say the MRCP is a positive for cholelithiasis and the liver enzymes are not resolving. What's the next step? Typically in a general surgery patient, you're gonna do an ERCP. But the question in your mind is, how am I gonna do that in this gastro bypass patient because I don't have access to the remnant stomach anymore because you've divided it, you know? And typically the rule limbs are so long that especially the way that I make them, is that you're not gonna be able to do a, a, a scope where you get all the way around the JJ and come up from the backside. It's too long. Uh, and so um, you're gonna to have to have some other way to access that remnant stomach if you want GI to do an ERCP. So how are you gonna do that? Um, you actually have to take the patient to the operating room and you actually have to access the stomach laparoscopically. So you, you would do it just like you're doing a laparoscopic G-tube where you put a couple sutures in the stomach, um, you stam it up to the abdominal wall, put a hole in it, put a port directly in to the stomach through the abdominal wall, then the GI doctor has access to the stomach and then they can do their, their um, on-table ERCP. They're gonna hate you though because they don't like doing supine ERCPs, um, but if you have a really good GI doc, they will still do a supine ERCP in the OR um, while you're there. Um, and then they can do the ERCP. If they wanna leave a stent, you can just mature this for a G-tube and then they'll have access to the stomach to go back later to take the stent out. If they don't wanna leave a stent and they feel comfortable with that, um, then you can go ahead and just staple off that gastrotomy and then you're done and you can just you know, not even like leave a G-tube on those people. But just realize that you can access the remnant stomach. You just have, have to take them back to the OR to do it. And if you can't do that or you don't have GI to do an ERCP, you can always fall back on your general surgery skills and do an open common duct exploration on these people, okay? So a couple of closing remarks. Uh, again, always fall back on general surgery principles. Like I said before, these people are, are not lepers. This is just GI tract surgery. Always remember to relieve obstructions, drain abscesses, feed the patient, and, and resect dead things, okay? Um, most of these emergent operations can be done laparoscopic. I know people say, oh, I know, I'm not an advanced laparoscopic surgeon, but that's okay. If you have basic laparoscopic skills, in my opinion, you should be able to do most of the things that I've told you today, which is remove a band, you know, drain an abscess, um, do a gram patch. All these things are things that can be done laparoscopic um, by a general surgeon. Um, always try to avoid uh, NG tubes and OG tubes. They're very uh, um, rarely, if ever, necessary, and they and they could potentially be harmful, especially during codes. A lot of times, anesthesia, you know, they intubate somebody, and the first thing they think of is, oh, I got to put a tube down, and they don't even think about did this patient had esophagus or stomach surgery, and if they did, that's not a tube you want to put down blindly. Okay. Avoid temptation to close holes. This is the biggest thing that I see when I quiz you guys during our, um, our Wednesday conference at David Grant is everyone wants to go in there and fix the hole, you know? So just avoid that temptation because a lot of times, just like with these duodenal and gastric ulcers, you're potentially gonna make the hole a lot worse um, if you try to put sutures in it and close it, okay? 
You must feel comfortable with flexible endoscopy. This is, in my opinion, a core general surgery skill. The American Board of Surgery thinks so. You guys now all now have to do flexible uh, FES um, uh, curriculum. And you should be able to take an EGD scope and put it down and take a look in somebody's stomach. Even if you're not going to do advanced endoscopy, you're not going to do therapeutic endoscopy for bleeding, you should be able to at least take a scope and put it down and take a look inside the stomach, okay? And then always consider PE in a bariatric patient. Um, you know, always have that in the back of your mind because that can, that's the silent killer in bariatric surgery um, of why people can die. So with any of these complications, always consider PE if they have any symptoms or related to that. And then know your anatomy. You know, these operations I said, are, again, are just GI tract operations. You guys learn how to do, you know, um, you know, ulcer op operations. You, we talk about ulcer op operations to death and we hardly ever do ulcer operations anymore. But everyone knows, you know, B1 and a B2. And you guys should know what a gastric bypass anatomy is. You guys should know what a duodenal switch anatomy is um, because you, need, you may run into those patients. You need to know how the bowel is going to be reconstructed. And then last thing is always be a safe surgeon. You know, do what you feel the most comfortable with. Um, and don't do anything that you've never heard of. Um, don't do anything that you think is experimental. Just be safe and do common general surgery things. Okay, that's all I have for you. Thank you very much for your time, and I'll take any questions. <laughs> Hillary. So to answer your first question, how do you get access to the abdomen? And um, you know, so my preferred technique for any of these operations, whether it's a, you know a regular uh, bariatric operation or a reoperation, um, is that I don't I don't I haven't done a sound cut down in like eight years. I mean, I, I do all direct optical entry, varies needle pre insufflation. Um, you know, I actually for those of you that have seen me operate, I actually use a tracheostomy hook. So I make an incision on the skin and kind of like go down to the fascia, grab the fascia with a trach hook and pull up on it. And then you can actually stick a varies needle and you have something to push against to pre-insufflate the belly. Once you got the belly pre-insufflated, you can do direct optical injury uh, and, and you've got this cushion of air inside there. Um, so uh, and the, a lot of times if these people are still fat and they have a really thick abdominal wall, doing a sock cut down is going to be a total pain in the butt. So really doing um, a various pre-insufflation, in my opinion, is probably the preferred way to go. I don't really care where you do it, whether you go left upper quadrant or you do it somewhere around the umbilicus on the abdominal wall. Um, I, I've done both and will do both and, and neither one really matters to me how I get in. Um, in terms of your second question about, remind me again. Oh, incidentally find it. So that's a great question. It's probably controversial. I think if you ask 10 bariatric surgeons, you probably get at least three to four different answers, um, even though it's probably only two choices, which is fix it or don't fix it. Um, and so if it's a very large Peterson's hernia defect and the, and the patient was not symptomatic, um, would they become symptomatic in the future? Maybe, maybe not. Um, and it's just like you know, saying, hey, if you have a, a, a big hole somewhere, you know, are you, are you gonna be better off closing it or just leaving it open? You know, it, it would go either. I personally, if, if I was in there, I probably would not fix it. But I think that you would see other people that would say, oh no, if I found an internal hernia, I would definitely fix it. JJ defects, absolutely I would fix. But Peterson's defect on any colic gastric bypass, I would I might not fix if it's huge. If it's a retrocolic one because it's a much smaller defect, I would probably fix that. Yes, sir. So back to case one, what do you do between the uh, gastric band inside the stomach? That's a great question. So you you need to remove the band, and then the question is, do you do it endoscopic or do you do it laparoscopic? Um, if you have a really good GI endoscopist that can help you or you feel comfortable with that, um, there are ways to cut the band from inside the stomach and to grab it and pull it out. That's very challenging and, and I consider myself to be a very good endoscopist and I probably wouldn't even try that. I would probably just take the patient to the OR and remove the band laparoscopically. Just realize that there's going to be a hole there and you're probably going to have to kind of close something over top of that um, uh, and then put some momentum up there so that it doesn't potentially leak and then I would leave a drain in that situation. But I would do it laparoscopic.
Um, there's also people that have um, reported actually doing it combined laparoscopic but through the stomach. So um, they would actually make a gastrotomy and then they would remove the band from inside the stomach um, so they don't actually have to um, take down any of the capsule that's on top of the band. Um, and sometimes you, then you wouldn't have to actually close any holes that are external. You would just have to close the gastrotomy that you created. So, yes, sir. As an acute care surgeon, one of our nemesis is the uh, uh, bariatric patient who doesn't have a biliary disease. You mentioned in the case six that these people are prone, especially if they weight <coughs> uh, to biliary disease. Correct. Is, your, is the incidence so low that it doesn't warrant a post-hysterectomy during the initial gastric procedure? Yes. Um, so it used to be in the old days, we used to always take these people's gallbladders out. 10, 20 years ago, that was like a normal part of these, uh, you know, uh, duodenal switch, malabsorptive operations, gastro bypass. But now we almost never take people's gallbladders out. And the reason is because the incidence of symptomatic cholelithiasis in these patients is probably on the order of 5% or less. So it's pretty low. And actually in the last six years that I've been here, um, I've probably only taken out two gallbladders on post bariatric um, uh, patients. And so it's fairly uncommon um, uh, uh, to see this. Plus now with the advent of us doing more sleeve gastrectomies on people, you still have access to the biliary tree. So certainly not in a sleeve gastrectomy patient and a gastro bypass patient, even in them, I still don't push very hard unless they have symptoms. And if they do, I will uh, ultrasound them pre-op. If they have symptoms and they have stones, I will take their gallbladder out at the same time, but that's a pretty rare occurrence. Yes, ma'am. On the first scenario where you had the gastro um, pouch that looked semi-ischemic. Yes. Has there been any um, reports in looking at the methionine green to help decide if you need to respect that would be a great tool. I don't know if I've ever seen any studies on that, but you know, with the advent of the robot having that now and, and using the iSpy and, and the, and the endocyanine green, I think that's a great option to take a look and, and inject that and see whether or not the stomach is viable. Um, whether you do it the initial time or you kind of do damage control, wait 24 hours and come back, I think that's a great option. Other questions? Dr. Ali. Th thank you for the talk and, and congratulations on just really kind of an amazing job with the program. It's um, sometimes hard to be a one-man show, but you've, you've done a great job. Um, these emergencies, I see a lot kind of like bile duct emergencies, right? Mm -hmm. you, you sort of, you know, how much do you do versus how much do you temporize the patient and then send them on to someone else to kind of take care of it. And I think you've done a great job sort of trying to, to balance that. But, but that's really kind of my question in trying to help our trainees who are going to perhaps be in an emergency room where they see a patient and you know where where is it that you you know how do you balance you got to take care of the patient versus doing something definitive maybe you're not comfortable with maybe you're going to do the wrong thing definitively mm -hmm. um, what would be your advice to them on that I, I think that it's it's the same advice as any other you know, general surgery problem that you're going to see, which is if the patient is acutely ill and they need an emergent operation, you may have to do something. But if the patient is not a, a, like emergently ill um, and you have time, you have 24, 48 hours or more, um, then you can potentially arrange transfer to another facility. So if somebody doesn't have cholangitis, you know, and they don't need an emergency ERCP, I mean, sometimes you can sit on these patients for a, a couple of days and they still do okay uh, when they're transferred to another facility where they have the capabilities to take care of these people. So, you know, if, you've, if, if it's an emergency situation, you may have to do something, um, but, but if you feel like that you can wait 24 to 48 hours and you want to transfer the patient, then that's certainly reasonable as well. Other questions? Thank you very much for your time.